today we're talking about one of my favorites and one of the passion of mine. So inclusion and accessibility in education. And I uh, really love this uh, topic, especially I started talking about inclus inclusivity and accessibility two years ago, just right in the right time when pandemic began. Okay, so um, let me move to the next slide. And please do drop any questions in the Q&A box if uh, they pop up. Yep. So as you've probably seen from the poster, beautiful poster that we made for this amazing event, I'm am I expert. Uh, that means that I'm Microsoft expert and also I'm Google certified, but level one. Um, I'm my trainer, fellow and technical winner of 2020. And we were almost so close to get to Australia, but it was canceled thanks to COVID, of course, if <laughs> things happen. And uh, I'm also a Flipgrid trainer. If you know Flipgrid, please um, let me know in the Q&A. So I would really appreciate it. Uh, Waco Advanced Ambassador and the winner of the trip to IST. <laughs> so I'm fingers crossed that this time I'm going to get somewhere. And as I mentioned, I've got passion for inclusivity, accessibility, project-based um, learning and global collaborations. And I'm a founder of Teachers Love Edu. This is a community of passionate educators where we'll, uh, we, we usually share and learn from each other. So here's my tweet a handle you will meet it on many slides today so uh, if you would give me a follow i would really appreciate it and let's move forward uh, welcome to my classroom and this is the very first virtual classroom that i have created around two years ago probably i'm updating it and it was created on uh, google slides so you can create it anywhere these days like jamboard or maybe canva or um, Google Slides I've mentioned before, also Bunsy. I love Bunsy. And if you don't know what Bunsy is, I'm going to mention it today. So this is one of the ways how you can um, make your classroom accessible and especially for your students, especially when you're online or hybrid way of learning or digital, there are lots of words and names for this. Um, so as I mentioned before, use many tools and um, I, I can't cover all of the tools today, but you can um, learn more if you would uh, visit my YouTube channel where amazing experts, my guest speakers, um, usually they share about their passions and teaching their practices uh, about educational tools and platforms, even platform developers, uh, my guest speakers. And it's really incredible. If you want to learn more, please check out the Teachers Love It Do playlist and you would absolutely love it, especially the latest one about butter and everything like this. So um, all of the titles are mine and we love storytelling. And uh, this is another example of uh, the accessibility and inclusivity thing. Like you can um, create beautiful banners, meet the teacher. You probably see this poster when I'm waving like this, there is a planet. And since I'm teaching online and I don't work in local schools, but because of the reason that do not use and support this inclusivity in their classroom areas. So uh, this is really important. So I provide private courses and I am a teacher of English and Spanish. And um, you can create these posters, you can use hyperlinks because it's super accessible feature. And I think everyone knows what a hyperlink is. You can use uh, posters if you use ThinkLink. If you have never uh, heard about this platform, I had a guest speaker. And if you like the posters and you, you want to make them interactive ones, please investigate ThinkLink, amazing tool. Um, so I'm everywhere on YouTube. You can give me a follow on Instagram or Twitter. And uh, here is Teachers Love Do, the poster of my um, community that I really like. I was a guest speaker this year, personal accessibility, engaging in content using Microsoft Week. Um, and I'm really proud of this. I was sharing with my practices and with the educational tools that they use to bring the sense of inclusivity and accessibility into the classroom. So at the very end, uh, or maybe even uh, earlier during this session, I'm going to share with the resource collection with you. So you can grab all the resources. You can learn a little bit deeper about this uh, tools about me, probably about all the things that you like. And this is a certificate, probably you will see it uh, in the further slides uh, that I grabbed from Lancaster University. Uh, that's how my journey to learning how to work with dyslexic learners began. And I'm super proud of this. So, and to today's agenda briefly, uh, we've done the about the speaker, 
uh, part and then inclusive education. What is this exactly? What is inclusive classroom? Why do we need it? How well do you know your students? We will uh, cover a little bit dyslexic awareness and inclusive edu tools, uh, ad, ad tech tools, whatever. So, and credits and resources that I promised to share. Please do not forget to use the Q&A box for your comments, replies, questions. Check out the Zoom chat links from the presenters. I'm going to share with a Jamboard link. And don't forget to have fun. Of course, you can, I thought I uh, have already mentioned about the following part. It's totally up to you. So uh, what is inclusive classroom? Inclusive classroom, why do we need it? If you have any suggestions, you can drop them in the Q&A box. And what, how can you grade uh, the level of the inclusivity that you provide for your students? And uh, how do you teach your students these days, online, offline? This is really essential. And especially if we teach online, we really need to bring this accessibility and inclusivity in our classroom. By the well-known reason, our students need to know where to go, what to do, what do you want them, what kind of assignment do you want them to take? Uh, all of this really essential. And um, let's go, let's move forward. Um, inclusive education. Inclusive education practices are about ensuring all students are made to feel welcome at school and are able to take part in all uh, aspects of school life. And my biggest goal is to create the sense of belonging for every student in my classroom. That's why I'm learning about the tools. That's why I uh, cho I have already cho chosen my favorite ones because there are so many platforms. We don't need this big number of educational tools. We need the uh, these ones that work with our students. So diversity is re respected and school-wide practices and classroom programs respond to students' different needs, skills, interests, cultures, and backgrounds. Um, okay, so why do we need it? Um, you, pro you will meet the credits on each of the slides that this information was taken from this website. Amazing website. If you want to learn more, you can uh, follow the resource link that I'm going to share a bit later. You can investigate more. In, and in class, inclusive classroom, I love inclusive more than that. I can't do anything about the pronunciation here. So general education teachers and special education teachers work together to meet the needs of students. So you see, it's not only about the work of one teacher. One teacher, uh, collaboration is the main and the most important word here. I'm a huge fan of collaboration and I love collaborating globally with teachers with our classrooms. And this is super inspiring and it will always work in the best way. So give, this gives special education students the support of they need while they stay in a general education um, classroom. All students can benefit from inclusive classrooms. What do you think? I think this is like, this is, a, this is a fantastic and it really works. If you've got different opinion, please do share in our chat. I would love to read it later, okay? So um, everyone fits together in inclusive education classroom. All students learning together. And this is super inspiring. Um, as I mentioned before, this sense of belonging is really empowering for every learner and student. Giving teachers assistance and support, this is, uh, I think it must be done in every school. We here, we don't have this much. I know I'm talking about my country and I know that we need to level up this thing in our educational system that's a big hole gap this is my pain point I should say focusing on abilities not disabilities especially when we learn when we work with dyslexic learners they suffer there is lots of tension you know there are a lot there is lots of stress uh, they can feel it every every day at school because read aloud uh, activities thanks to them teachers still use it it's not appropriate for them or you can do it but in project way as I love I love reading aloud read aloud project we've got it but I'm using it in fluid in a synchronous way for instance and I provide lots of audio practices for them so teachers are learning to expand their skills connecting with individual learning styles honoring the needs of all pupils equally valuing other cultures and perspectives celebrating diversity and individual uh, individuality. So the uh, nurturing shared respect and empathy, these uh, all are really essential. 
So uh, teaching students of all abilities and backgrounds together. This is all about inclusive education, giving teacher extra support with learning specialists, expanding instructions to address different learning styles, creating a learning environment of respect and empathy. So we're going to dive in. I'm not a doctor or professor, so I'm not really uh, created theory, but this is our theory part. Next, we are... This one? This one? So this is a demonstration of how I um, introduced Immersive Reader to my students. Immersive Reader is an incredible, inclusive tool that uh, is free, absolutely free, and uh, you can use it like with every age, uh, students of any ages. Because um, especially with students who are struggling with reading, with focusing, and with your primary learners, there is a translation for more than 65 languages. So if you work at school where a um, student like EFL teacher or ESL teacher, this is an incredible tool. So if your students can't read well or they are struggling with the translation and your assignments are provide, uh, provide uh, you provided your assignments in uh, different in second language, for instance, and students are struggling with understanding, uh, Immersive Reader is the best tool. You can highlight different parts of speech. You can use the line focus, and I'm going to demonstrate it more in uh, further slides, okay? So um, you can learn more about Immersive Reader and all of the tools, while I'm not forgetting <laughs> here to mention this, on my YouTube channel. Again, I recorded this video, and this video was shown during the Microsoft Accessibility Week. So there are tools and how they work in the classroom. Um, I mean, um, Unit two, yep. task one. And this is all about, uh, that I've mentioned before, what does it mean to be dyslexic? Uh, this course I've taken around maybe six years ago, and I was totally inspired, not because I got the certificate, uh, but the task here was given in unit two, how our dyslexic learners feel themselves in the classroom when they do assignments, when they do their writing. I felt this, and I that time, um, I had this inside how it's difficult for them to work with the text, to write things, and to work with these letters. That's why we need to provide the visual digital um, space for them where they can choose like breakout rooms, I mean, uh, the choice boards and all of the things that they can take so they uh, can uh, choose the task that they feel themselves more comfortable with the task where they can read out the task, not read, but understand with picture dictionary that is an immersive reader, by the way. And what are the most um, important and empowering tools for dyslexic learners? Of course, visual ones. And I um, attached the link to this course to the collection. So if you would like to learn more about this task and everything uh, there, so you can investigate again. So how uh, do we know when... Okay, one second, please. How well do you know your students? What does it mean to be dyslexic? And there is the link to Jamboard. I'm going to share with the link right now in the Q&A box. Just give me a sec. I'm going to close it for a while. And uh, you will meet some questions there. So you feel yourself free to add your comments. Uh, here is the board. I want to demonstrate it. But first things first, I'm going to drop the link into the chat. Let me see that it works. Okay, I'm going to share it right now. And I need to see that the link is for editing, not only for viewing. Okay, let me check it. Mm -hmm. Share. And I'm copying the link and sending you out over here. Please do check it out and join this Jamboard. I see that someone has already joined us. Thanks a lot. And Jamboard is a great tool. Again, it's really easy to get inside. You know, your students, if they've got the Gmail, you can create the Gmail. So like email Gmail for your school and share with your students, not your personal one. So your students can collaborate on the same board together or you can um, attach this uh, in Google Classroom, like separate boards for them to create a project. Since I'm a big lover of project-based learning and I don't want that my dyslexic learners or other students with disabilities um, like miss this chance to get the certificate. I do teach 
Annie, because the same teacher is in one who is responsible. Mm -hmm. That's great, but collaborating together is much better. Um, this is my daughter. <laughs> so, and uh, I love your comments. Wow, you're really fast with it. That's amazing. I love the GPs or GIFs. Uh, this is my favorite part. You see that I'm using one as a not like a background. I just uh, use you know the or the orders of this, so it's in the back, and uh, you can move forward and you can see these questions. You can uh, answer them in your own path. So it depends so like which one you would like to take first. Maybe you don't want to be a part of this. So. Um, there is another question, how to teach dyslexic learners? Your ideas, I would really appreciate it. I'm going to mention a few, but that's only my experience. I would love to hear from you too. What is in class and classroom? Why do we need it? This is uh, the third slide. And the fourth frame, it's called framing and Google Jamboards. What are your favorite to do tools that can support dyslexic learners and bring the power of inclusion, inclu inclusion into your uh, classroom? I'm going to mention them, but you, uh, can see that they are all already something has uh, added. So any questions left, you can uh, ask any questions here or any feedback, it will be amazing. And uh, this is the Jamboard. And I, I'm sure that you have, you are familiar with Jamboard because I like Google uh, tools because they're um, easier, I think, than others, for instance, in um, Mira board. I love Mira, I'm going to mention it today too. But, uh, this, there is little number of features you can use text, you can use background feature, for instance, you can create worksheets for your students, and they can add text and boom, and especially with integration of Google Classroom, it's going to be a really great plan, and all the assignments are going to be uh, attached and everything is really, I, I like this, you know, the planning part. Wow, I love this pop, I love when the sticker is popping up, it's incredible. And uh, let me move back, I guess. So this is all about Jamboard. You're most welcome to join the board and share with your expertise. I, I would appreciate it. And I'm moving, we are moving forward because I can talk a lot. I'm a big <laughs> talker. So um, this, I'm really passionate about inclusion and uh, let me do to the presentation. Okay. So what does it mean to be dyslexic? I suggest you to take the course that I'm going, I have mentioned and attached to the collection. So dyslexic awareness, of course, you know that how to, how to get that your students uh, have got dyslexia. For instance, at our schools um, here, maybe somewhere in Moscow or in the center of Russia, uh, there are super great specialists, but I've met so many students who came into my classroom and I discovered that they're dyslexic and their parents, they didn't know that. I, the only question I asked their parents, how do they read in their first language, Russian? And their parents said, not really well. I said, hmm, interesting. And just imagine how they struggling reading in second language in English. English isn't even the second language in Russia. Wow, this is a tricky thing for them. And they're so stressed reading out aloud because our teachers here, they say, come on, read out aloud in front of the class. Wow, this is, oh, I can't speak about this. <laughs> Too stressful. Uh, so there are many forms of dyslexia. We're not going to discuss them today because it's different uh, thing. And I'm not such a special create special educator. I'm just a teacher who shares with ex experiences of how to, um, what tools we can use to help our students. Uh, however, some signs of dyslexia may include having difficulty reading specially aloud, struggling with spelling, problem remembering the sequence of things, finding it hard to follow instructions. That's why, um, you know, choice boards are amazing tools. You can create them on Google Slides, uh, Canva, Collaborating feature on Canva, this is the latest and the best, I think. Um, also, you can use Bansi, you can use Google Jamboard and all of the things, you know, only one link and a good organization, uh, it's really great. So a misbehaving or disrupting the class, being very quiet or shy, especially when doing reading or writing activities. That's why asynchronous way of learning or flipped classroom, these, uh, these are the ways. Um, falling asleep in class. I've seen that one of my uh, students, it was very first lesson and we had our, everyone made mistakes. I made my, mine. I, uh, I said, okay, we're going to read aloud. And he smashed his book because I didn't know that time. It was very first lesson that he's dyslexic. But I didn't say anything, of course, because <laughs> um, 
Uh, unfortunately, I took this course and I started to think, what's what's wrong with this? Why is he so stressed? And then um, I asked him, can you read out this word? A really easy one. He couldn't because, you know, for them, it works in a different way. Ooh, and the, he um, and he was so stressed because his teacher is cool. It, uh, I had this uh, lesson in the evening. Okay, all in all, he had his lessons at school in the morning, and then he came to my lesson, and that's why he was so stressed because this pressure is cool. It's incredible, and the way of teaching dyslexic learners it must be given in different way. But inclusive classroom, it's when everyone can be involved. And this, again, the sense of belonging, everyone uh, is engaged, you know? Oh. Okay, so we are moving forward and uh, just how to teach dyslexic learners. I would love you to share with your ideas. Uh, here are the credits because I, I took this picture from the website. And I really like it because it, it, it really demonstrates how to teach. Of course, with visual content, lots of visual support. Many teachers, I don't want to create these posters, but nowadays you can use lots of templates. And I, I don't have much time these days to be a great creator, honestly, but I know great platforms where you can grab amazing templates. Canva, Bansi, a huge uh, library of templates that you can take, you can add it and you can implement in your teaching. Uh, again, Jamboard, you can find lots of amazing templates too, and so on. Nowadays, I use platforms only with, with templates only. Uh, lots of flashcards must be given. When we were, I'm teaching online more than, I think, around six years, but uh, previously, most number of my classes were offline, of course, but I do know that flashcards can be different. You can use flashcards on your board. I'm going to demonstrate you. And um, of course, if students, they can't read, they can't, they can understand because dyslexic learners, they're not really well organized in the, they, um, it takes more time for them to memorize things. So that's why planning is really essential there too. And I'm using Google Calendar, of course, to plan all of the things. Uh, now, how to teach dyslexic learners from my side, so getting to know them, get to know their strengths, weaknesses, and interests, as well as their learning profile, what it means. Uh, here are the pictures of the platforms that I use for this, uh, to gain this M. And um, I, my work starts before the study year begins. How? I'm a big fan of digital portfolios, not only of mine, but for my students. So I start creating digital portfolios, and also I start um, collecting the data information about my students before the study year begins. Like meet the teacher collection. I introduce myself to my students. I create collections or well, Google Classroom, uh, Google Classes, um, Google Classroom, yeah, sorry, uh, where I can gather all information. And before the study year begins, everything is organized. And I know what are the interests of my students, who are they and their hobbies. Um, what are their interests and then i can understand depends on the age of course of the students what platform we are going to use for instance if they're online learn lesson i'm sorry i need to check the time <laughs> i can talk a lot about this um uh, so I, I i do we need to use zoom for instance zoom is not really doesn't work really great with my primary learners so i use water or uh, google google meet but i'm not a big fan of google meet it's really raw thing to me, uh, personally to me. And um, next, creating a collaborative culture in the classroom. Use activities that focus on building understanding through sharing ideas. I love PBL and project-based learning helps me a lot. Where can we collaborate with our students? If we are online, especially. Of course, Jamboard, we've just seen in that. We can collaborate on Mira, on Whiteboard from Microsoft, and, um, and other great platforms like Wakelet, for instance. Um, Word Online, Google Doc, and many more. Microsoft OneNote is a great thing too. Providing multi-sensory tasks and activities instead of only telling the story. Find images that illustrate the events or draw a story path for learners to follow or get them to vis visualize the story. And you know, the sequences of these uh, scenes are really important ones. We, we know that storytelling is really powerful. I love it, especially when we can um, 
put something personal there. Students can really um, memorize it really well. And I love Bansi because there are lots of stickers and you can create really beautiful digital storytelling. Um, I would love to show you, but I think we will finish the slide. I'm going to hop on a mirror board. I want to show you this space, one of the boards. Uh, Google Class, uh, oops, oh, sorry, I didn't see anything here. So setting clear manageable instructions focus on one thing per lesson. For them, it's really essential, especially for dyslexic learners. Where can we create our choice boards? Let's count. Jamboard, Google Slides, Canva, Bunsy, mm, PowerPoint. Lots of lots of platforms nowadays. PowerPoint that's too much for my students, so I'm not using it these days. Sway, by the way, Sway is a great tool for creating presentations too. And um, also, you can create presentations these days on Mirpod. Uh, Book Creator. And if you haven't tried Book Creator yet, you can create really amazing uh, digital stories with your students. My students created their books about me. Uh, then my fan books, uh, they're big lovers of BTS, you know this. And uh, I, I wanted them to try create something personal. So they chosen, uh, some of them chosen to create a book about them, someone about BTS and someone about their favorite authors or people who inspire them. So it depends, uh, choice, choice, choice is really important, essential here. So providing multi-sensory tasks and activities instead of only telling the stuff, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, and adapting your materials. This is essential, depends on the age of your students and et cetera. What's it and, like to learn math on Brilliant? Brilliant gets you hands-on to help you learn by doing from the Pythagorean theorem. Is the it from my side? I'm sorry. I think it's not mine. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not mine for sure. And I just want to demonstrate your Mira. Um, please drop a comment if you use Mira. If you're familiar with Mira and you use it, you can put double pluses, okay? Double plus. If you have no idea what Mira is, like minus is enough, okay? Can you bring it into the chat? Like, do you know what Mira is all about? Anna said, thank you, Anna. No, you don't know. But it's great that you will learn something about Mirror. Actually, it's a big, big platform. It's um, limitless. So, um, but you know, the space, the limitless um, for one, for, uh, okay, one second. There are three, three boards. If you want to have more boards, I, I can show you this. I don't usually show the space, but uh, there are no names, so I can show you. I've got three free boards. If you want to have the fourth one, you need to pay for this, but I'm not paying these days. I, uh, they are limitless. It means that the space, you've got so much space. I don't, I don't see the point to be so organized to have more than three boards. And uh, you can upload here PNG pictures, uh, PDFs, but not like really heavy ones. I have never heard of, wow, you have never heard, you will love Mira. Just believe me, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated than Jamboard, but check this out. Um, you, can, you can add uh, different frames. You can uh, search for these frames. For instance, I've got a frame for my individual lessons. You can have frames for your um, classes for instance. And if we go to one of the frame, you can see that I attached, <laughs> yeah, I love workers these days. My students love it. You can attach different hyperlinks. This one is integration uh, from Bansi. So this is a presentation that I just integrated here to this frame. And I really love it. Any, por favor, I want to say in Spanish. Uh, there is a link to my Google Drive to our audio, number one. And you can attach different pages. You can organize with frames, different, different shapes. You can provide something that my students really like. If they achieved in something, you can create stars. You can add text. You can create mind maps because Mira was made for collaboration with your colleagues, like brainstorming activities or mind mapping. And this is amazing. Lots of free templates that you can take. Um, I would love to show you, uh, since you are interested in Mira, I hope that you are, <laughs> I want to show you my favorite activity uh, that I really like. My students love playing. We play in the field of magic, you know, that when they need to, I, I think we can call this activity guess the word or mystery word, something like this, you know, there are squares and they need to guess 
um, okay, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it, let me see. Yeah, it's a little bit heavy since, uh, uh, since there is limitless space. Yeah, I just want, it, it takes some time to, so you can see all of the things here. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so I've attached uh, without any background pictures, like Liva, and this is Volcano. And the task is, you see, we played um, this project I made when I was a part of the leader um, speakers in um, project with Georgian kids. Uh, it's in Russian, but we do the same with my ESL EFL, uh, students. So <laughs> this is an activity. They need to guess the word. So that's how you can check out the vocabulary, how well they learn this. And, you know, there is a house and uh, there is a mystery word. They need to guess this word, and if they make a mistake, the so lover Leva came a little, comes a little bit closer to the house. <laughs> so just a, a bit of fun that you can create on mirror board. And this limitless possibility. We love playing mystery animal and mystery um, mystery country, and all of these things. Like, uh, can you guess the animal? Okay, and there are the questions because my primarily primary students uh, really like playing this, and they are not well with memorizing such. So such big number of uh, phrases. So can you guess now the mystery animal? Is it big? Only yes, no questions. That's why I have got these cards. Like, and if you want to move something, you can do like this. Click this point. You can lock these objects because students sometimes you know they're messing around or not on purpose, but uh, sometimes things happen. So uh, big big boards that you can use with. Mm, there are more options than on Google Jamboard. So I highly recommend try Mira. Mira three boards are free and they are limitless. So most welcome uh, to try because it's it's great. And let me uh, move back. Mm -hmm. on, the, on that slide, I also mentioned Quizlet. That's how I help my students to memorize vocabulary. But Quizlet, it's not only learning the words, it's also if you prepare with your students for the exam and you need to learn the definitions, they can take Quizlet because you know the different the, um, types of activities that help them to uh, memorize it, even the writing ones, audio, test, and uh, selection and gravity. And also you can, students can listen to these words. If they can't read well, like dyslexic learners, they can listen to, there's audio feature. You can create this card by yourself as a teacher it depends on the um why why do you need it yeah why do you want to create them also your students can create them i have a paid web version and uh, i can create classes i can curate my students work so i i can check out how well they um did or maybe they haven't done this activity yet so i can create all of the things mm -hmm. So um, again, if you've got any questions, please let me know, okay, on the tools. And uh, where we stopped over here, um, I think we've done with this part. And now we came to the part where we talk about inclusive tools and platforms. And there are lots of them, <laughs> just believe me, there are lots of them, and I'm so happy because the number of inclusive tools um, is rising. And this is super inspiring. I started two years ago, and now voila. So you can see how many great apps are here. And I just want to highlight my favorite ones. And if you've got uh, your camera, you can scan this uh, QR code. Um, but I think the link to this you will find in the resource collection that I'm going to share later. Um, or maybe now, but okay, we're short of time. Um, I want to highlight that, uh, why do we need this inclusive tools? Just let me, give me a second. Uh, of course, to support every learner in our classroom. This is the only and the main reason I want to show you the very first one. I'm going to check out the gym board. That's fantastic. And I'm going to close the mirror board because I don't want that our internet connection would uh, glitchy. So I would love to start with Wakelet. And let me go to my main profile over here. You can organize all of all your digital space, uh, but without such um, strong curation feature like on Google Classroom on Wakelet because Wakelet is an amazing tool. I just want to show you that you can create your profile as meet a teacher. Check this out, landing page. 
uh, this is me, my bio, uh, connect links, you can organize all of these sections. For instance, class B, class A, newsletters for parents, for students, uh, just what, whatever you want to organize. This is my ELT section that I have created to support my uh, colleagues across the globe and uh, my community. Teachers love it do section again on Wakelet. I'm a Wakelet ambassador and a passionate Oh, I'm a passionate Wakelet ambassador, so for more than two years in a row, I'm sharing on Wakelet, and Wakelet is something that we need to touch like at the at, at any other session, okay? Because it's uh, lots of things you can create there. Flipgrid, uh, holidays, and etc. So you can create sections, and you can create collections. You can also create. Spaces. For instance, you're a teacher, you've got several classes, and uh, you can create class again, B, I, C. You see all of the spaces, I created them here. And it means that if I click on this space, there are going to be collections, yeah, on the specific topic that you have created. What you can add in this collection? You can add different links, YouTube links, any link from the website, any link text, PDFs, PNGs, GIFs or GIFs. And um, okay, just uh, I want to show you how immersive reader works. For instance, you create a space with instructions for your students. Any assignments you're learning about uh, the author, if you're a history teacher, you are learning about revolutionary period, one of the re revolutionary period or anything. You can create your video instructions because there is integration with Flipgrid. And you probably see that this uh, section is collocations and my students are preparing for their state exam and they need to read out really well aloud the text and how if they are, for example, if they're dyslexic learners or for, if they are not so well and good at English, you know, that's tricky moment. And they create, we created this space where we uh, add text. And then my students practice their reading aloud by clicking on this icon. And now I'm going to demonstrate you how immersive reader works. There are three areas. It's really easy. And my primary learners, they love it. Uh, you can listen to this text. I think human rights only became an issue. Beautiful pronunciation. We can go to voice settings. We can uh, turn a little bit down the voice speed. We can switch from female to male. Sometimes it, it matters for some reason. After World War II. Yay. So now it's a little bit slower. If we go to um, reading preferences, we can use the line focus, especially for those who can't concentrate well. Um, I love this, by the way, myself. You can um, increase the number of, of lines that you need to focus on. And I think it's really great with uh, people who have got uh, poor eyesight, especially picture dictionary is always turned on on my computer or in my immersive reader and I always curate before I share I always um, share um, demonstrate immersive reader to my students before I suggest it to use of course so choose the language more than 65 languages you can translate it uh, we can use uh, for instance I'm using Russian and because some of my especially primary uh, students they don't understand so well, all of the words. So I choose Russian and I can choose the option translate by word or the whole document. I'm not a big fan of translating the whole document because I want my students to uh, learn English well and only one word only. So we keep this. What else we've got? Drama options. We can highlight the parts of speech. And when we learn parts, parts of speech, I think in English is really essential because the order yeah, is strict there and um, uh, we, we can highlight them we can use the show labels and that's how we learn it that's incredible also we can go to text size if you can't see well do use it because this fantastic increase space I like this option a lot fonts comic sounds is the best like um, especially says they said that they say that comic sans is great for primary learn learners especially and themes more colors you can see how many colors there are and I don't know why but it's magic to my students when I demonstrate immersive reader and they have got uh, they they under realize that they have got the option to choose this color it it, it works like magic 
uh, psychology, you see, um, thing. I, I, I really think that it's magic. So, and they love, of course, they like yellow, turquoise, and something like purple that's most of the time. I don't know why. So please do share which one, is, which is your favorite one. I also like this one, dark sim, my favorite one. And if we go to uh, checking this, you see, I click on the word and I can listen to this word. It's in Russian. And I also can go to uh, here, to the word, but picture dictionary doesn't work uh, with every word here, right? But um, with each year, the number of these pictures um, is increasing. It's incredible. You see, if your students can't read well, they can see the picture, like look, and they see this picture like today and here and people. Yeah, you can see that picture dictionary works. And this is the best tool for dyslexic learners and for everyone who learn languages or struggling. Or for instance, you teach students whose parents are from originally from another country and they don't understand the language that in which you teach. So the newsletters that you provide them Wakelet is the best space and all the platforms where immersive reader is, is the best space for everyone. So my students know how to read words because of an immersive reader, they, there is a read aloud feature. They can repeat, they can see the picture dictionary, they can see the translation to more than 65 languages and they can use hyperlinks. This hyperlink will brought to the Cambridge Dictionary Online and you can put any hyperlinks. Like it, it's amazing. And if you provide instructions to your students, you can use hyperlinks first. Watch this video. You can insert the link to the video or you can use the hyperlink in Wakelet. The best tool for organizing things in your digital classroom or offline classroom, but I think we all um, online these days, but I, I'm not sure. Um, so this is about Wakelet. And of course, Collaborate on Wakelet is incredible. This is our project. Uh, we were part of eTwink project, let's be friends and teach uh, students from four countries, different four countries like uh, Portugal, Brazil, Russia, we were part of this and Turkey. Um, and they could collaborate. We use Wikilet to grab all the information, activities, resources, and you can collaborate with your colleagues. I always create these collections. And uh, this is our webinar that we provided uh, with teachers from I think uh, six different countries um, on Wakelet and <laughs> it was fantastic and uh, the videos on YouTube. So I suggested to follow it. And also Flipgrid, uh, since we are short of time, <laughs> um, I have many more tools to show. Um, this is a space where your students can create their video responses. There are lots of settings since uh, in Flipgrid Shorts camera. And um, of course the first question, why? do students need to create the video responses? That's about privacy. Everything is super private. Teachers can create accounts only and they create a private spaces for the students and students can see the assignment. So you provide the assignment. Students, you need to share with your uh, ideas, with your, so with your thoughts. This one of the topics that I have created who inspires you and my students, they share with their responses. I can share with the space. So that's why I opened this one. And Assignment, but how your students can um, understand what they need to do if they can't understand this language or they can't read well. There is immersive reader icon that you will meet over here and every, everywhere and every uh, tool where this, which I mentioned, you, where, where you see this icon, it means that you can use immersive reader and all of the features that I have demonstrated, there are, so you will find them. Uh, students can um, listen to the reading aloud, they can understand, they can use the translation, and they can use the picture dictionary, and all of the things. You probably see how it works here. So Immersive Reader works with all of the features, and I suggest you to start using Flipgrid because it's amazing and it helps your students to build uh, really strong social communicative skills, and you can collaborate you can hear every students in your classroom. And that's the pl platform that can provide you asynchronous uh, way of learning. So if your students are shy or probably they're dyslexic learners, they can try to record their voices, to share with their reflections in the private and safe space like Flipgrid. You can close like 
and I mean the privacy of this video of each student. You can create every little detail. You can use the guest password to, to invite teachers or oh, sorry, uh, parents to listen. You can create mixed tapes of your student voices. Uh, it's like digital portfolio of voices. I call this uh, this way. And I always share with parents, with their parents of the um, achievements that their students did and made actually. And this is incredible, super inspiring. I would love to mention Bansi. Bansi is like presentation, Create you can create beautiful presentation and especially your primary learners will love this tool because uh, hyperlinks, all of this, can you see the amount of stickers that you can use? Uh, there's beautiful integrate video integration and I you can create digital stickers, pages I created and every learner can understand what this sticker means. Is it an achievement or where is your home task? You know, home, something like this. You can, uh, you can create really beautiful digital presentations in Vansi. And we were a part of um, Read Out Aloud project. And who was Mother Teresa? And my students could uh, practice their reading aloud by uh, choosing the immersive reader and they could understand how to how these words must be read yeah so there is immersive reader and it works the same way everywhere where you put where you use text feature on Bansi, immersive reader works really well and there are lots of more that you can learn on Bansi about Bansi. Uh, we created, uh, my students and I, we were presenters live on YouTube for Bansi team. And we shared with all of these amazing um, ideas. But I think you will love it, uh, probably. <laughs> I'm not sure. About Jane Godel, you can learn about famous uh, people. You can create amazing collaborative open chess projects about your country. Oh, one word, I like this, by the way, activity from Bansi team. Uh, you can create grammar projects. Uh, preposition self place and all the stickers are with the brilliant quality i'm not working there just these days you should understand that I just enjoy using this platform and my students were part of like as i mentioned different projects and they created bounces for different um like ways where they needed to create things like postcards uh presentations and all of the grammar projects we always use bouncy for this I mentioned, um, I haven't mentioned Word Online because in Word Online, if you go to, one second, uh, to the view by, to the view area, if you click, you can see Immersive Reader. And that's how you can um, provide your students chance to understand what is given as a text. And all of these features uh, work the same way. Also, there is another uh, thing that you can try. Uh, I think this is in um, uh, in insert. Let me find to it's drawing header symbol adds in link. There are lots of options to, uh, to try and to use, but I don't think that it's in this space. Let me see. Edit. Uh, there is a new check accessibility. This is an incredible one. So you can check accessibility. Lindsay, I'm out of time, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, you need to check out because there are lots of uh, things for accessibility in Word Online. You can use um, a, dictate, a dictate feature so your students can check uh, their texting, like their typing. For instance, you can check um, their, their awareness of the text or of the words that they are saying or anything like that. So or word dictation feature, they speak you need to turn on this feature they they speak and the text uh, appears on this uh frame yeah so and also in one note you can meet uh, immersive reader too oh my gosh yeah there's so much information um i need to cover uh, the, in the same area you need to go to insert and you can select uh, but first you need to choose which area with the text you want actually this is screenshot <laughs> this is screenshot and i do remember that it worked for immersive reader you need to try it and wonderopolis you can find lots of amazing um text and different topics for your students and immersive reader is already integrated here quizlet i have demonstrated you and if you use microsoft page browser you can uh, see that uh, immersive reader is already integrated to this browser and this is incredible so if you click on the tag you can find immersive reader there is a book with a 
speaker. Um, I have already mentioned this. And I think I'm going to finish my presentation uh, with the sharing of the resource collection that I mentioned before. Um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I think it's in QR code. So I'm going to open this one and I would love to finish my speech. Oh my gosh, where, where am I? Ah, I'm in hush. So let me see how it works for now. Okay, I just want to finish that with the saying that every child has the right to quality education and learning. Uh, I like this quote from Inclusive Education website, and I think the link is going to be um, in the collection that I'm sharing. And this is the resources area. Uh, you can scan this QR code, and you can, um, and you will appear. You will be brought to the collection with the resources. Okay. <music> Hello, and thank you everybody for, for being here. Um, in our time together today, I wanna to talk about how we can turn pandemic pedagogy into permanent pedagogy. Um, in particular, I'm hoping to think together um, about how we might advocate for the compassion that so many of us have tried to cultivate during this pandemic to become the foundation of our future pedagogy. So um, I will talk about specifics later on, but I just wanna be clear from the outset that my remarks today are rooted in my experience teaching undergraduate humanities classes at a large state university with a hugely diverse student body. So I'm hoping that everybody here uh, can find something useful in this talk, even if you need to adapt it for your own context, or you know maybe if it's even just helpful to think with. Um, and then I should also say that this talk is informed not just by that experience, but by the research that I engaged in beginning in 2017 in the scholarship of teaching and learning, um, specifically for how uh, scholars of pre-modernity and the early Middle Ages in particular um, could responsibly engage um, the politics that we found in our classrooms. So um, that research culminated in a special issue, which I guest edited, of the Wabash Center Journal on Teaching. And, um, you know, because academic presses are glacial, um, it came out in 2020, uh, August of 2020. So um, I was supposed to have that linked in the comments, but for some reason the link didn't work. I can, I'll send that out um, later on. Um, if you do go to my Twitter page, it's linked on the Twitter page because, um, yeah, so. Okay. So um, first, uh, when we're talking about pandemic pedagogy, I want to just make a distinction between two types of pandemic pedagogy. So the first is this panicked pedagogy, and that largely refers to the frantic transition to remote teaching that characterized for so many of us um, the spring semester of 2020. So for me, it looked a lot like wrangling with technology, uh, new technology and old technology that decided to you know, not work, um, uh, trying to figure out how to take attendance over WebEx, right? How, like in anything approximating an efficient fashion, how to have students hand assignments in over a learning management system that my university had decided to stop supporting the previous semester without telling my department. Um, you know, just all of all of that stuff, right? And then, you know, doing this while losing access to childcare and worrying about the health and safety of family and friends. So it also meant um, dealing with many students in acute crisis, even for students who did not lose family members or get sick themselves, and many of my students did. I mean, Rutgers, we, we have a lot of students, I had a lot of students who were in Queens, and Queens got so hard hit. Um, but uh, they, even for students who, you know, didn't lose family members, didn't get sick, they were still dealing with mental health issues, food insecurity, housing insecurity, lack of access to technology. And as we've talked about so many times, you know, today and yesterday, lack of a space in their homes in which to study. Um, a good number of my students had to go leave the United States entirely and go back to their home countries. And so even meeting was difficult because of time zone differences. Um, those three months were just, you know, chaos um, and fear and exhaustion and heartache just all around. And um, so I don't want to discard the insights of that time, but I just want to separate um, the pedagogy of this period from a more consciously executed pandemic pedagogy. 
So the second type of ped pandemic pedagogy is the prepared pedagogy that many of us cultivated or at least aspired to cultivate for fall 2020 and following. We knew that we would be teaching through trauma. We knew that we would be teaching through exhaustion and through uncertainty and that we would have to use technology wisely and you know that we could assume very little about what our students' experiences might be, except for the fact that at the time of enrollment, they thought that they had a reasonable expectation of being able to work towards success in our classes. So we knew, in other words, that we had to build compassion into the courses that we were designing. And so this also meant moving from a case by case style of compassion, where you know we assume that students are fine until we are told otherwise. Um, and then we deal with exceptions and extensions and accommodations, et cetera. And we had to move from that, um, if we were using that before, um, to a form of compassion that instead presumes a need for care, you know, where we just assume from the outset of the class that students will at some point need flexibility. So um, I do wanna also add here, this is kind of important, but well, it's very important. Um, this second form of compassion um, is more sustainable in part because paradoxically, it does not require specific compassion. Specific compassion is based on a meaningful connection between the student and the teacher. And some folks might object to getting rid of or sidelining specific compassion, but especially because we always want to see our students for who they are. You know, um, we want to see them as individuals and we want to create these personal relationships that are supportive, right? But given the reality of compassion fatigue and also given the reality of all of the unwitting biases, biases that we have as humans, that all of us have as humans, as humans, we just can't guarantee that if we follow the specific compassion model that we would be equally compassionate to all of our students. And so we need to bake in some non-specific anticipatory compassion into our classes, that, 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 that's crucial. So right, it, this does not preclude specific compassion, but it means that our students won't suffer if we can't give that compassion for whatever reason, because we've got the baked in sort of anticipatory compassion. Um, already there. Okay. So uh, for the panicked pedag pedagogy of spring 2020, it is just, it's important to note that it largely allowed us to survive, but it wasn't sustainable for the most part, um, or, or a lot of things weren't sustainable. Whatever insights that we glean from it, we need to recognize that, you know, what works in a crisis and what might even be the best decision, a great decision in a crisis, is not necessarily something that is scalable or applicable to a non-crisis context. So um, my university, and I, I applauded this, they made pass-fail an option for all classes, even in major classes and even prerequisite courses, you know, and those are just not typically allowed. And they let, their, they let students see their grades in their classes before they had to decide whether to take pass or fail, or whether to, to take a class pass fail. Um, so it was, it was beneficial for the immediate crisis, but it's not sustainable for the long haul, because to do that, you need to assume that the students will at some point come back and seek out the skills that they missed in this moment of crisis. And so if you just keep doing that, then just students are get, you know, irretrievably behind. It, it's, it's not sustainable. Um, okay. But uh, this panicked pedagogy did make it crystal clear just how much compassion our students might require in order to be successful in our classes. We could not assume, as some of us may have done beforehand, that our students had safe learning environments or internet, internet access or, or even food. So it was also a great stress test. I mean, yeah, thinking positively, it was a great stress test for any classroom strategies or pedagogical tactics that we were using, right? If something worked through the spring of 2020, if it worked well and it could be sustainable, that's definitely a strategy that you wanna keep using or consider continuing to use. So prepared pandemic pedagogy, um, which is a type of pandemic pedagogy that I'm, I'm hoping we can make permanent, involves first and foremost, the active choice to foreground compassion in our pedagogy. So now that we know the sorts of things that our students might be up against and how important compassion is for keeping them on the path to success, 
we need to avoid going back to any form of pedagogy that requires our students to leave their humanity at the door. Um, which was never possible in the first place, but a lot of us and a lot of our, our colleagues pretended that it could be. And, you know, many, many people even thought that it was ideal. You know, we have this idea that the classroom is a totally neutral space, an apolitical value neutral space. And so that is actually one of the things that my colleagues and I were arguing against in our special issue of the Wabash Journal. Just that every classroom is inherently political. And, and, and we bring our whole selves into the classroom, even if we try not to, um, in many respects. Okay, so this means that we have to be pointed in our inclusivity. We need to be conscious of potential barriers, you know, whatever access issues that we know might occur in any given semester, we need to plan for them. And this means that we have to think through every course element, every assignment, and, um, you know, imagine what barriers there might be to students achieving what they need to achieve with respect to that element, with that assignment. But it also means that we need to be equally mindful of rigor. So in our compassion for our students, we don't want to hurt them by lowering our standards. So just as an example, and I know you guys all know examples like this, but I knew a senior journalism major who had no grasp of formal syntax and could not communicate clearly in a written fashion. And he had been doing fine in his classes because his, and he'd been doing well in his classes, straight A average, because his teachers just gave him A's and, you know, he was, he was a first generation, low income student. He had a hard backstory. Um, he came from a really rough area, really rough neighborhood um, and all, all of that stuff. And his teachers didn't wanna hurt his GPA by giving him bad grades. And so he wound up completely unprepared for his chosen profession, despite having a high GPA. And so this is just a dramatic example of misplaced compassion. And while I'm sure his teachers were all well-meaning, I wonder if part of it was that they did not want to do the difficult and awkward work of supporting him through a reality check and helping him improve. And I also wanna say, I can't really fault them, right? It would mean a lot of time and effort. And given the prevalence of contingency in academia, it is extremely likely that all of his teachers to that point had been overworked and underpaid. Um, but if it was compassion that motivated their leniency, it didn't end up doing him any favors. Right. It was the it was, you know, it was compassion for the sake of the giver, not for the recipient and, and therefore not really compassion. So but I want to also be clear, being mindful of rigor means that we must not lower our standards. It does not mean that we should not rethink them. At every step, we need to be asking ourselves what our pedagogical goal is and whether our standards are informed by that goal or whether they are simply a matter of habit. More often than not, it's it's habit for, for I, I don't I don't want to speak for this community. I feel like if you're here, you're thinking through that already, but I, I know many colleagues who, you know, they will they will mark a point off for a split infinitive, even though that makes no sense in the English language. Um, okay, that's a separate point. Okay, um, so if we manage to achieve this compassionate balance of inclusivity and rigor, we also need to make sure that it's sustainable. Could we do this forever? Or, you know, at least for the foreseeable future without sabotaging our students or burning ourselves out, <laughs> like burning out. <laughs> um, because making our courses sustainable for the long term is also, it's crucial for our self compassion. We should also be having some compassion for ourselves. Um, but most importantly, here, this pandemic pedagogy should represent an ideal pedagogy, a, a philosophy of teaching and learning that we love, that we endorse, and that we believe in, that we rave to our deans about, right? And that we shout from the rooftops, you know? This is something that will be the salvation of our civil democracy, right? If you believe in a theory of pedagogy, that's how you should feel about it, right? So this is a broader ideal that needs to be at the heart of future pedagogy. Okay, but why? <laughs> Why should this pandemic pedagogy that foregrounds compassion and balances inclusion and rigor become permanent? Um, well, for starters, I think that uh, contemporary American politics shows the need for valuing kindness and empathy as civic virtues. We need to be able to communicate across difference and um, to learn to listen rather than to assume, based on our perceptions of somebody's positionality, what their life experiences have been. This is a first step to equity 
to bringing everyone to the table. Um, or, you know, to spin out that metaphor a little bit um, of figuring out that we need some other type of meeting space because a table isn't just going to just isn't going to work for everybody. So a pedagogy based in compassion and inclusivity might help improve public discourse. Um, but if that's too idealistic for anyone, um, we can focus on the well-established facts that inclusivity is necessary for effective teaching, that it's necessary if we're going to expand access to education, um, you know, which is important for all of the reasons that um, Dr. Ossie Nielsen mentioned yesterday, and um, that it is necessary for the elevation of academic achievement. In academia, same as in the business world, diversity leads to greater innovation and better results. But most importantly, um, we need to acknowledge, and again, this is something Dr. Asi Nielsen said, uh, we will never not be in a pandemic. Going forward, nat natural disasters are expected to be the norm. Along with political unrest and upheaval, we need to assume that our students' homes will be destroyed by floods, by fires, that things like power outages and food insecurity um, and supply chain disruptions that will disrupt their attention to our classes, you know, on the regular. Um, this last point, though, I do want to um, nuance a little bit because we have never not been in a pandemic, or at least not at Rutgers. Um, before COVID, at Rutgers University, on any given day, 40% of our students were either housing insecure or food insecure. 40%. And this was in good times. So yeah, our, our students and our communities were dealing with pandemics of poverty and inequality, and we were just not paying attention. Many of us, most of us were not just, just not paying attention. Okay, so um, for the rest of our time together, I wanna talk about strategy. How do we expand our repertoires for exercising compassionate pandemic pedagogy? What might that look like? And how do we convince our administrators to not only share these values, but to support our efforts? So um, I wanna share about some of the strategies that I have used and the commitments that I have. But before I do that, I, I need to situate myself a bit. So I am an assistant professor of religion at Rutgers University. And more specifically, I'm a medievalist historian of Christianity. I teach undergraduate classes um, mainly and a few graduate seminars, uh, a few graduate classes. Um, and it's, I usually teach a combination of lower level surveys with you know, 40 to 100 students and um, upper level seminars with anywhere from five to 40 students. And I teach a two, two load. So uh, also if I have more than 60 students in any one class, my department will hire a grader for me. Um, my job performance assessments, my tenure, is primarily based on my research, but uh, teaching is a necessary component of both my promotion requirements and uh, my own motivation for being an academic in the first place. Um, I just, I love this material. I love sharing it. Um, I love the discipline of religious studies. I love sharing that with students. Um, most of the students that we get in the religion department are not majors or minors. They tend to be students trying to fulfill uh, their gen ed or writing requirements who've never taken a religious studies class before and they weren't interested in the topic to begin with. They do not have a lot of buy-in. Um, okay, so as I said before, um, Rutgers is incredibly diverse on every possible metric. And this is a point of pride. For, for the university. So um, there are a lot of resources here for inclusive pedagogy. So for any instructors who are interested um, and, and all instructors are, are encouraged and incentivized to use these resources. So we have dedicated specialists to assist us. Um, and there are also monetary grants, awards, course releases and peer support groups for people who wanna to try to adapt their classes. I also know that my department supports me. So um, even 10 years ago, um, it used to be that faculty would be flagged if all of their students got A's. You know, faculty were essentially mandated to grade on a curve um, because the assumption was that if you're giving everybody A's, then the course wasn't rigorous enough. Um, but with inclusive pedagogy, the goal is for everybody to earn an A. <laughs> if my students' grades get flagged somewhere along the university pipeline, um, my department and my dean have my back because they know the principles behind it um, and they endorse those same principles. Okay, so this is the context in which I'm talking about inclusivity and compassion. And here I just want to pause, especially if there are any administrators in attendance here. 
Um, it is not impossible to implement inclusive, compassionate pandemic pedagogy um, without the type of support that I've gotten. You can do it, right? It is entirely possible. But every element of support that I've had from my institution has made it easier and quicker and better. And it has made it possible for me to do it without burning out. Uh-oh. Did something happen? Your screen stopped sharing. My screen stopped sharing. Okay, so let's, oh, because it's been disabled. Um, can we get that back? I am no longer allowed to share my screen. Yeah, let me get Dr. Taylor back in here. Okay. Um, so let's see if I can um, go from my notes. I think, right, so you guys all saw that, that slide. Um, and I just have a few more things to say about it. So I'll say that while this is, um, right. So, um, so I was talking about how like institutional support really matters for all of, for, for in being able to implement all of this stuff. Um, if you are an instructor without similar supports, and if you haven't implemented any sort of inclusive pedagogy yet, and you want to, don't be afraid to start small, right? So every little bit helps and trying to do too much at once could very easily mean sacrificing yourself and your well-being in a desperate attempt to disrupt a broken system. This is not something that an individual can just fix by themselves. So this is the systemic thing and we need administrators to recognize that. Okay. Um, so the next thing I wanna do is get into actual tactics and actual strategies that I think could be part of or the foundation for this compassionate pandemic pedagogy of the future that I'm advocating, but I really would like for everybody to see um, my slides for this. So let's see if I can, oh, hey, there we go. All right, you good? Can you guys see? All right. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> So I'm sure that some of you knew where I was going with this. Um, I feel like I've been kind of like dropping hints left and right, but I think that one of the best tools, if not the best tool at our disposal is universal design for learning or UDL. Um, so this chart here to the left might look daunting, but um, for anybody who is not familiar with UDL, um, it's really a very, very simple principle to grasp and to apply. And you know, once you accept a few basic premises, all of the specific guidelines in this chart just seem like no big deal. So um, universal design is a philosophy of architecture that privileges the broad functionality of a constructed space. So this just means that when you're designing a building, you need to make it accessible from the planning stages onward for anybody who might want to enter it and use it. That's it. So, you know, you don't assume that everybody who enters the building is, can use stairs, right? Or has a certain body size or, you know, can see. So you make the building as accessible as possible by design. The same principle holds true for, pre for pedagogy, universal design, design for learning. That's the idea that we should make sure that our course works to educate all of our students, regardless of their preparation, regardless of their socioeconomic status, their technological access, or their ability status, right? When we are designing our courses, we stop envisioning our ideal, ideally privileged student as our target audience, and instead we refocus on what our course objectives are and how we can make them achievable by the broadest array of students. How can we eliminate unnecessary barriers to our students achieving those course objectives? So um, here is a incomplete list <laughs> of what I've done in my classes um, as again, a college instructor in the humanities. Um, okay, so first thing, um, and I should also say that a bunch of these things are things that I had been doing um, for quite some time before the pandemic, and um, some of them, uh, and the reason that I'm talking about them is because they did really work. They, they passed that stress test. Um, and then some other things are things that I have developed or doubled down on as a result of the pandemic. Um, but so um, recording and sharing all of my classes. Um, this is a great thing for students with anxiety. 
and uh, you know, people who are just anxious about missing anything, um, it, this actually allows them to be present um, in the class if we're in a physical space, um, or you know, if we if we were having a, a, a synchronous meeting they're not going to be afraid that they've missed something, right? So they can, it's, it's one source of anxiety gone and they can focus on being present. Um, but this also helps, you know, students who miss class for whatever reason. Um, in For in-person classes, um, this policy helps me ban laptops um, because, you know, all the research shows that, you know, the sort of typing out everything that the, the teacher says does not actually lead to a cognitive participation in, in that um, learning. So, um, yeah, so, so laptops, this helps me ban laptops without making my students impossibly anxious. Um, and it allows people, again, to be fully present in the classroom. Also, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Rutgers, but um, just the New Brunswick campus is five different campuses that you have to take buses to go between and those buses break down. And I actually, as a teacher, I could not use the buses because it happens so frequently that um, the buses would just be full and I could not get to my class at, on time. So, you know. There's a lot of reasons to record classes if you're teaching at Rutgers, <laughs> but I do think that it's it's a good thing anyway. Um, okay, um, uh, number two, assuming responsibility, teacher responsibility for widespread failures. So this is more of an attitude adjustment. So if a whole bunch of students did poorly on an assignment, I used to get exasperated and I would complain to my colleagues about, you know, the students misread this or, you know, why didn't they read the syllabus? It's in the syllabus. Um, and, you know, but, but thinking with compassion and focusing on the design and the objective rather than, you know, my sort of fictionalized idea of what it should look like. Um, I can see that if so many students missed something important, there's probably something wrong with the way that I presented it. There's probably something wrong that, or so, so something, um, maybe not wrong, but suboptimal with um, how I could, tried to convey it. So, you know, I need to do deal with that, preempt it this time around. So for example, um, if there's a quiz or a test and everybody gets a question wrong or most people get a question wrong, um, clearly I did not explain that concept clearly enough. And um, you know, I eliminate that question and I come up with other ways of testing that knowledge. Um, Okay, assigning personal reflections. Um, so one element of UDL is that it recognizes that people need motivations, you know, a reason for seeking access to the building, to the class in the first place. And especially because I teach classes that nobody wanted to, actually, so the fun thing is that students tend to say in their course evaluations that they were happy they took the class, even though they didn't want to. So that's nice. Um, but right, you have to work to motivate students and get them interested. And, um, one of the te techniques that I've used um, is um, at the end of the semester for 5% of their grade, they have to reflect on the work that they did in the class and what they learned from it and um, how their thinking has changed, how the thinking has not changed. I have had students who, you know, have basically told me, yeah, everything you said the semester was BS, you know, like, I, like but, but, but they were thoughtful about it. So good for them. And this is the sort of thing, like, if I can tell that they put thought into it, that they were actually, or, you know, if, 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 if it looks like they put thought into to it, they just get you know 100% of this 5%. But the thing is, they have to review what they've learned over the semester and reflect on it and reflect on it in relationship to their identity as a scholar. So, whatever their major is, how might this be relevant? Um, whatever you know, their questioning style is, what things that they are interested in, um, you know, hobbies, even how, how can this relate to that? And so, um, so that, that that's been um, uh a universal uh, accessibility tool. Um, okay, this is a big one that this next one, um, I allow infinite revisions. And this is where contingent faculty, um, I, I do not recommend this for anybody who does not have a grader. I do not recommend this for anybody who is being underpaid and exploited. Um, but if you have, um, if you have a job like mine where you have lots of support from your administration and lots of support from your department, this is a really good thing to do. Or if you, know, if you have very small classes and you have this amount of time. Um, so for big writing assignments, um, students are allowed to resubmit at as many times as they want to, to get the grade they want. The rules are that they have to submit something like on the deadline or, you know, just let me know that they, that they, you know, I, I, 
I don't need to know why they've missed a deadline. I just need to know that they know they missed it. And honestly, um, the only reason I even have that rule is so that students don't just save all the work to the end of the semester. <laughs> um, but, you know, so if, if a student comes to me and they're like, oh, wait, um, oops, I, it's fine. Everybody gets permission to revise, but um, they have to submit something. I have to respond to it and then they can resubmit. Um, and we can do that as many times as they want to get the grade that they want. For quizzes, um, and I know you guys have already, so many of you guys um, have already done things like this, but this was a revelation to me. Um, you can automate quizzes. Um, so basically have, uh, you know, the topics that you want to be uh, the, the focus of the test and then have question banks for each of those and then have the quiz um, or the test randomly generate, you know, however many. Uh, questions you need. And then students can retake the exam as many times as they want to in order to get the grade that they want. And when they do that, they learn so much, right? Because they're correcting their own work. They're thinking, okay, well, why this answer and not this answer, right? Um, so that has been a game changer. I just, I love that assignment. Um, and it really works for, it really works for I mean, it, everybody. So I, I just, as, as, a, as a, I forgot to mention this at some point, but, but at a certain point, the way that you test UDL is that when your students come to you with accommodations, you know, those accommodations letters that they have, you know, at the beginning of the semester, everything has already been accommodated for. You do not have to make any exceptions for any students because your students are already accommodated. So it's actually less work for you if you, you know, less work on the back end. Um, okay. So, um, this, both of these infinite revision policies are um, only available to me. I think they're, I don't think that I'm unique in this, but um, Rutgers allows faculty to change grades at any point up until the time the student graduates. So doesn't matter what semester it is, doesn't matter what time it is, you can change a grade until the student graduates and in fact, although they don't like advertising this, you can change a grade after the student has graduated. Um, so you just get a few deans permission to, to, to do that, but you can. So um, when I say um, that they students can revise things as many times as they want to get the grade that they want, I have students still completing work from three years ago, um, and you know it's getting better, and you know they're continuing to engage, and you know it's kind of fun. Um, okay, so. Um, yeah, so no time limit on grade changes is, is very helpful. Um, and then, right, so a big thing here is to have alternate assignments for time sensitive things. So um, for example, with the quizzes, the quizzes are time sensitive in the sense of the entire class has a week to take the, um, the quiz. And then after that point, we're going over the answers, we're talking about it. It's just not productive for somebody else to take the quiz, you know, knowing already that they have all that ha they could have access to all of the answers. Um, and so um, what I ask students to do if they have missed a quiz or missed, missed one of those tests um, is I, I give them the list of topics that the test covered, and I ask the students to come up with their own multiple choice questions um, to meet, to, to answer those things. And so whereas in, in the test, there would be five questions on the topic, I only make my student come up with, with two. Um, you know, they, they don't have to completely replicate the test. Um, but it really does show that they've mastered the, um, that they've mastered the material. Um, okay, and then so discussion boards is another thing. So I have weekly discussion boards um, where, you know, students, and this is for my, uh, currently I'm teaching a remote asynchronous class and um, my students participate in a discussion board and then the discussion board closes. I respond to the discussion board in a lecture that I record and then they watch that video and then on their own time and then they have to respond in another board. So if a student misses that first discussion board, they'll frequently say, oh, okay, well, can I just add a discussion post in? I was like, well, no, because I've already synthesized that discussion and responded to it and sort of corrected, you know, things and, you know, we, we've already engaged in that. And um, so what I'll have a student do if they've missed that that timely assignment um, is, for example, because the point, right, the objective of the peer of the, the discussion um, was to get the students to engage with the material and their peers in triangulation with one another. So um, to replicate that in a sort of asynchronous fashion, 
um, or an untimely fashion, um, I have students um, take two of their, like they look at the discussion board, they take two of their classmates' comments and they connect them through the material and discuss why the students have different views and what their third view is. So it's not perfect, but it is certainly, um, I am confident that they have met the objectives of the assignment when they hand that in. Okay, and so a lot of this, just all of this really goes back to having clarity with respect to learning objectives. Right? If you are clear about what the goal of an assignment is, you can, it promotes flexibility. You can, you can make good, compassionate choices about how our students can achieve those goals, even if it's not something that we have thought of before. Um, and even it's, if it's not what everybody else is doing, because if a student needs an accommodation, every student is unique. If they need to present something orally as opposed to in written form, right? Like, why not make that accommodation if it meets that course objective? Okay. So the last thing that I want to do before opening things up is to reiterate that this is not something that we instructors can do well on our own without institutional support. We need our institutions to have our backs and we need them to support this and they should, right? As I noted before, and as I'm sure all of you know, inclusive pedagogy is effective pedagogy. This model benefits our students, it benefits our faculty, our communities, public discourse, if you'll go with me on that. Um, it's the right thing to do and you know it also helps our bottom line by helping helping make our students more successful and our programs more successful and also drawing in new communities of tuition paying learners. So, you know, good for the money, right? Um, so I will say um, there are ways, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm enamored of my university, but there are ways that they could do more. You know, getting course materials adapted for accessibility is a huge task every single semester. And it would be phenomenal if we could have like hire student workers to help us with that, you know, even if we don't have 60 students in a class. So that's just one example. Um, there's, there's always ways to support. Uh, so for administrators who are here, it is, there's always more ways to support um, your, your teachers. Okay. So um, any comments or questions before I open things up? Okay, so um, I wanna know, and um, we can all, uh, you can raise your hand or you can just unmute and start talking. Um, what has worked for you? Are there things that you have found in your classes um, that, have, uh, that you can balance inclusion and rigor you know, while incorporating this compassion? Are there things that you like? And I'll open up the chat because <laughs> you probably should have done that. It looks like you're getting good comments in the chat as well. Yes. Already. So actually, thank you, Mark. This is a wonderful question um, about anxiety, right? So are we feeding into their anxiety avoidance by giving them an opportunity to avoid school by giving them a lessons online? Are we perpetuating a serious issue with many students? Okay. So, um, one of the things that is new to me from the pandemic is I now off uh, the, the first thing I do in the semester is before the semester starts, I have everybody fill out a um, a, a survey, you know, where, you know, what's your name, how's it pronounced, like, what are your pronouns, like, what, what's your major, all of the getting to know you stuff. Um, and then I also ask, you know, what is your learning environment going to be like this semester? Um, what, what access to technology do you have? Like, will you be reading course documents on your phone, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, um, I, and then I ask, is there anything else that you think I should know? And if anybody mentions something like anxiety, I actually reach out to them individually and I say, look, this class has a lot of flexibility and depending on what types of anxiety you have, um, this might be um, trickier for you. Like it might seem overwhelming because the flexibility, because of the options, um, it, it, it can be more difficult. And what I do in that email is I really just open up line, a line of communication and um, students typically, have responded either by saying, you know, yeah, this, this isn't the class for me, I'm gonna try something else. Um, or more often um, it starts a conversation and they end up succeeding in the class because they always feel like they can come to me. Um, you know, so, so those, are, those are the two main options, but yeah, it, it is one of the things about, um, the, the, the course is designed to help people alleviate anxiety, but anxiety is such a, you know, multifaceted beast that, um, sometimes it could end up exacerbating anxiety. And so that's why I flag that. Um, it's not a perfect solution, um, but if anybody has any perfect solutions, I, I 
Yes. If you have any thoughts about how I could handle that better, I would be grateful. Um, okay. As a student with like severe academic anxiety, that just sounds so helpful because it's so much easier to manage things when you feel comfortable enough to communicate it with your professor rather than feeling like you're going to get shut down automatically for struggling. But I really like how you went around that. Thank you. And, and that's actually because, right, th this is also for a lot of students don't want to tell the professor that they have anxiety. So this is actually something that I mentioned in my welcome in video. I will say that, you know, just like as a heads up, students who have anxiety, um, this format is sometimes overwhelming. Um, but please contact me. Like I, I make that overture. If somebody doesn't want to self-identify, I still want to be able to give them that heads up. Um, but but yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that that seems um, helpful for, for you. Thank you. I actually didn't see who made that comment. <laughs> oh, here. Uh, now I have everybody. You know, I can. Um, okay, great. Um, so yeah, what? Um, okay, I'm going to open up. There's one other question that I had to ask you guys. Oh, and I am so sorry. I keep missing things in the chat. Um, yeah, right. Being able to rework assignments. I mean, I the, part of the thing is I know this from my own work. My work is so much better when I revise it, right? I mean, anybody who's in publishing or I mean, I don't know anybody who doesn't know this, right? Um, but okay, I'm I'm sure you know people who don't care about writing at all or care about you know, but but you know if you're producing something, it's great to be able to revise it and perfect it and talk about it with your peers and you know so and then come back and make it better. So um, I do also want to ask add one final question to this conversation to see if people have thoughts. Um, like, I know Rutgers has all of this stuff, um, but what structural changes would be helpful for you at your institutions to support compassionate pandemic pedagogy, you know, being broadly adopted? Um, and, you know, what changes would you like to see? What would be helpful across the board? What can you ask for? And truthfully, I would love students, our students, to, to respond to this question and to some of the others, because it would be helpful for us to bring back to the institution, to MSMC. So what do you think? I think this is a powerful discussion to have. Um, I don't, so I was popping in and out. So I'm sorry if this is completely irrelevant, but I think that it may not be. Um, so I think that, Teachers checking in more would definitely uh, be helpful and checking in, even if we might not all feel comfortable saying this is my problem, you know, whatever, but checking in in a way like there are things that we can do that's anonymous, like answer garden we use at the first day of this conference and everyone was allowed to reply anonymously and it was a way for you to answer these questions and that way the teacher knows okay there's five people who said this so maybe you know or if no one said anything great you can keep moving on even though that a person doesn't like self-identify and also I think having the option of taking classes either in person or hybrid or being like oh can I be virtual today or like having that kind of flexibility for me would help so much rather than being like I know that classes were always in person before, but now it's a little bit harder. I don't know, this might just be a personal thing, but that would help out. I do think, um, oh, just uh, one of the things that I did not have a chance to do, because I haven't taught in person since um, fall, March of 2020, um, but uh, so I don't know how it would work to have students um, but you guys all do. I mean, so many of you have talked about this. There's so many people in this conference have talked about doing this, you know, half of your students are in the room, half of your students are, you know, online sort of thing. But so that is not something I'm familiar with, but it's clearly possible. And, um, you know, so, so yeah, that's having that option. Why not? You know, it's the, the structures are there. Why not? I think some of what institutions and I think our institution face is the is the business aspect and and this is it's real but it also creates all these other problems if if the people who are paying the bills are saying well my kid is not on campus why should I pay the same amount that that he would if he was there 
it, it, it makes it hard for an institution to survive. Rutgers is a different institution, but we've got to figure out the ways for all colleges to give, to give access in the same way. Um, and that is, that's an issue of equity. It is. And we face that all the time at every, at every grade level, at every type of school that we face in so many different communities. I think that's brought this to the fore, the pandemic has brought that to the forefront um, more than ever before. Um, I love the fact that you included UDL and universal, des universal design for learning. It's actually, it, it like, it's kind of, and this is terrible, but it's like, it's, I love it so much. It is, it answers so many questions. Um, and I, I've kind of um, just been recommending it to everybody for everything. It's like, oh, you're having, you know, a school board issue with equity in the classroom. Look, UDL, then, you know, you don't have to scream at each other about, you know. Um, anyway, I don't know. Like, I just think UDL would solve so many problems, not just in education, right? Just if you think about who's going to be using it and make it as broadly accessible as possible. Right. Um, yeah, it just makes so much sense. Now, I, for those of you who don't know, universal design for learning really comes from working with special ed, special needs kids. I missed that step. Yes, yes. So we've been doing in special education universal design for learning for many years. The fact that it's becoming generalized more and more is just so valuable. Uh, just such a wonderful um, example. And my classes know this. We talk about fidgets. And how when fidgets came out, um, fidgets were just for a particular population of kids and they didn't want to stand out. But when everybody started loving the idea of fidgets, fidgets became a norm and that we can use them in our classes because they do admit for many kids help, help them to focus and, and reduce anxiety. And the, the stigma regarding something like that is then gone. And so there's so much more that if we concentrate on how, how valuable it is to, to make our rooms and our, our environments accessible, we move so much farther in terms of increasing inclusiveness in our schools and in our, in our world. Well, and, and I also like 100%, the, where where UDL and sort of this compassionate planned pedagogy comes in, I think, is just, it is exhausting, right, as a teacher trying to accommodate everybody. But if you do as much of that as possible before the semester, so that you don't have to think on the fly, so that it's just baked into the structure of the class, um, it just makes it easier on you, and then you can focus on you have less work to do. You don't have to be the arbiter of whether a student excuse is good enough to get an extension. Um, you know, they don't have to pretend that their grandmother is dying when they just had a depressive episode, right? Like, like how it's just, it, it's so much easier on everybody and it frees up that energy to put to things that matter more. I could not agree more. I love Anna. Anna gave a, an example in the chat. Yes. Oh my God. Well, I mean, I hate, Rutgers, New Jersey, traffic. Oh my gosh. I mean, even regardless, I, I the number of times that I've had students like show me pictures of the car accident that they were in and that's why they weren't in my class, you know, but you just never know what the semester is going to, life happened, life happened. So uh, yeah. All right. So I think we're ending here. Do, does anybody have any last thoughts, any last suggestions for uh, your classmates and for um, like people at Mount St. Mary, the administration? And, and feel free to email Dr. Taylor afterwards if you, you know, think of something later, because this is one of those things. The university administration, um, I think too often they only think about the bottom line and they think of teachers as, you know, um, not as people to support, but as, you know, money makers in some, I don't know. I don't know how they think about teachers, but it doesn't often result in them, not specifically at your school, but it does not often result in them taking us seriously. And that is something that is unique to Rutgers. Uh, maybe not unique to Rutgers, but it's something I very much appreciated being there. And um, anything that we can do to make the case to administrators that they need to take our students and us more seriously 
on this front and to support us in supporting our students so that we don't feel like we have to take on the entire system by ourselves. It is going to help their bottom line. It is going to help the school as a whole. So well, I have to just agree with you. And I think so much of what you said is so important. We, I think faculty is valued at, at the Mount. I think they really want us to have this, the strategies and the structures in order to be successful, but there are still things that are in place that can mitigate against that. And those are the things that we can work on to make those, those changes in flexibility. So we don't have to make such like requests to change this grade or to do that. So there's more flexibility in that. But, but I do think that the college understands that without faculty who really care about students, who really want them to be successful, there is no college. There is no commitment to, to the future. So because our students are the future. 